Yes, Manjar is one of our new artists featuring on Digital Bacon FM. It is 11 o'clock and a special interview today with Stephen Barnes, who's going to be joining us on the line from Hong Kong. He's making up for the two shows that he missed. Good morning, Stephen. Well, hello there and a very good morning to you, young man. Very long time since we've spoken. Telcom and uh, electricity getting in the way. Have you missed me? Absolutely. It's your wisdom. Everybody Atta misses boy, your that's wisdom. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> so, how have <laughs> things been going? Yeah, okay. Um, Chinese New Year's rapidly upon us, and uh, things is just starting to uh, slow down a little bit now, thankfully. So, opportunity to pause and um, catch one's breath. Um, I'm heading off to the UK on Saturday for a week or so. So, um, I'm going to be taking advantage of uh, the downtime in Hong Kong that uh, occurs when the Chinese New Year holidays are on. Now, are you flying out on Friday or flying on Saturday? Uh, Saturday morning, very I, I, early, 2 o'clock a.m. Oh, I are selfishly because, of course, you're back in with us at uh, 11 o'clock on Friday. No, 10 o'clock. Yes. Yeah, I'll be uh, I'll, I'll be here and I uh, I won't sleep between now and then either. <laughs> because you're busy or because you're thinking about your show? Because I'm so excited <laughs> to, you know, do this stuff with you, Jason. My life's not the same now, thanks to Digital Bacon. Oh, you're so nice. I've actually recorded that. I'm going to play it back to myself. Anyway, on to serious matters. Um, yeah. Before we get on to Don Tapscott, um, something's been plaguing me and I wanted to know a little bit about cyber squatting given that you're a marketing maestro a internet brain and of course have the benefit of a formal education at the LSE and are a lawyer yes we have our crosses to bear that's true Mm -hmm. right cyber squatting tell me um okay well I mean I don't know a great deal about it right but Mm. what I can tell you anecdotally is that if um somebody is, uh, has claimed your your domain name, um, basically the first thing you do is you make a report to the local registration authority mm-hmm. um, if that uh, cyber squatting practice relates to you know your national domain. So in your case, it would be a, a .za domain. Mm-hmm. Correct. Um, on the other hand, if it's a .com, then uh, your options are not quite as um, readily accessible. Uh, essentially, the World Intellectual Property Organization, I think they're called, um, they offer an arbitration system where, um, as I understand it, if you own a trademark um, in relation to a particular domain uh, and someone else is clearly squatting on it, then uh, you can enter into, well, firstly, you make a report, stroke, complaint, and then engage the good offices of WIPO um, to arbitrate access to uh, that domain for it to be basically transferred over to you. But my understanding is that you need to have had a registered property interest, mm. um, intellectual property interest in that domain before you can uh, go uh, to the World Intellectual Property Organization. And that means trademark registration. So if you've got trademark registered in that name and it's a dot com, then you know you head off in that direction and uh, uh, and play that uh, play that out. Okay. But, but ultimately, mm-hmm, sorry, uh, yeah, go it, on. Is there, and, and I, I'm, I'm cynical for at, at, at the best of times, is there any logical reason that somebody would want to buy the domain.com of a, um, a business that there is like, th- there is no other like it in the country, there's no other name that's the same in the country, and it's the same town with a population of less than 2,000 people? Why would somebody do it? Is is there anything less than nefarious going on? Well, it's, it sounds to me that it is nefarious, right? I mean, if you've got the wherewithal to um, uh, pirate traffic to a um, you know a party that that's actually got. Uh, Real inter- intellectual property interests in uh, in the language around that domain. Then there's only one reason for doing it, right? And that's to try to uh, basically profit off of it uh, mm. in some way, shape, or another. Which really sort of dovetails you back to ultimately what life was all about before the connection economy came along, and that mm. is 
um, you know, what, what uh, intellectual property rights do you have in relation to a particular uh, name or collection of words? Um, and, uh, and then what are the actions of the, of the pirate, if you will, uh, to basically um, uh, disabuse you of your ability to, uh, uh, to, 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 make, to make revenue off of that, uh, right. that domain, if that's what you do. So, so, you know, notwithstanding the fact that we're talking about domain name registrations, ultimately what it is, what it boils down to is uh, national trademark and international trademark law, uh, and then in your own jurisdiction, the law of passing off, which is uh, a common law uh, yes. tort. Yes, well, that's, that's um, my, that's my you, belief. Yeah, so, so basically what you do is, uh, you know, you get, you get a lawyer to contact uh, the pirate uh, and then assert your intellectual property rights against them. Mm. And uh, uh, basically threaten threaten litigation uh, if they don't uh, deliver up the site or uh, cease and desist to pirate traffic from you as a result of them actually owning that site. So uh, basically, roll up your sleeves and um, bring out the uh, the lawyer big guns and uh, and, and and shake uh, rest, sorry rattle their cage and, uh, and and let them know that you know you're not going to sit idly by and allow them to uh, basically profit off uh, what for them has been a simple action, which is to go on to God. I and just register a domain for you know uh, a few uh, a few tens of dollars if uh, if maximum that mm. yeah so shooting one across the bow before they do anything gives them puts them on notice not to attempt anything and just to either put it to bed um, or or hand it over yeah, I mean, it's good legal practice if someone is clearly seeking to um, uh, to rip up, rip you off in some way or another via a registration of a domain name. Then you know, I, my philosophy is you know, go after them wholeheartedly if if it's clear that they're doing it to um, to to try and uh, take traffic away from your internet activities or disabuse you of the ability to to make you know legitimate uh, revenues and profits off your intellectual property. So yeah, get uh, get the lawyers off and as you say, fire a shot across the bow and let them know that you know you're not prepared to um just take it sitting down as we say in africa we're not gonna take this shit well you know <laughs> you guys are all uh, all tough hardy uh, you know country folk that uh, <laughs> uh, that have got uh, i've got the, the way will not to take any sh1t right yeah i think you you may have seen that uh, cnn well actually it's it's even on scmp this morning about the uh, the poacher who got what was coming to him Oh yeah, that was uh, some. It got ate by a lion or a pack of lions or something. Yeah. I wonder. I yeah. wonder what he. the lions. <laughs> he was sitting there thinking, mm, "I'm going to get me a couple of trophies today." I wonder what yeah. the last few thoughts that went through his mind were, like, "Shit, this wasn't such a good idea." And probably, know? oh shit! I would say <laughs> just as you know that the the fact the fatal blow was struck. Somebody somebody sent me a um, a YouTube video the other day of these muppets that decided to put on a um a zebra, a zebra outfit and run around okay. and run around in a game park okay <laughs> with, with other zebras <laughs> and, did, they get, did they get shot no they there were lions there oh so, i see okay so i see the, yeah. the, the, sort of the end of the video is these little lions chasing after this basically human human in a zebra outfit with this human in the zebra outfit throwing bits of the outfit off and these small lions chewing on this head i mean definitely a darwin award um yeah. uh, what an idiot anyway. That's, okay, a, a sort of a, i can, can just see that scene right so like a pantomime horse running across the, uh, the savannah exa exactly yeah. that they would have they would have probably had a couple of drinks beforehand and thought shit this is such a good idea they would have had a couple of drinks afterwards and said never again no. Yeah. Um, so are they, are they still alive to tell? Yeah, the tale no, they were, were still alive. The, the lions win? No, 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 they were still alive to tell the tale, <laughs> and I'm sure they would have told it uh, wearing adult diapers for a few, few times after <laughs> that. Um, right, Don Tapscott, your intellectual yeah, good hero. Man. Good man. Mm. I, I was watching something on the internet, and he was talking about blockchain economy. Uh, lots yeah. of big words in there, which throws me right off. Uh, but obviously linked to Bitcoin. Um, well, uh, yeah, my relationship with Don Tapscott, if you can call it that, you know, really precedes the whole blockchain story. 
um, Don Tapscott is a, a public intellectual. Um, he's got senior honorary roles in academia in Canada. Um, he's got uh, his own think tank or two and presently is um, very much on the leading edge of promoting uh, a future world which will be driven by blockchain, um, enabled capability and smart, tra smart, smart contracts, which, which is a, it was a whole other discussion again. Blockchain is, is an emerging technology that, that is going to layer on top of all the dynamics of the connection economy and um, ultimately uh, probably form a completely new type of operating system that you might say is sort of web.50 if we're at web.30 right now. So it's it's all good stuff over the horizon. But Don, Don Tapscott's been writing on sort of business automation driven by inf uh, information technology since, um, to the since the mid-1980s. And uh, he uh, then got very prolific in his writing and thinking in the mid-1990s, um, setting out our sort of our, our digital future. His crystal ball is absolutely turbocharged, and you know, in the final analysis, what I came to understand from all his um, all his work uh, was that the connection economy is all about disaggregating and reaggregating value. What used to work in the industrial economy can't be expected to work in the connection economy because it's all different. Mm. Um, and his books are. Um, uh, New Promise of the Information Technology, as I say, he's a prolific, prolific writer. He wrote a book called Safeguarding Your Privacy in a Net World, Networked World. Uh, then he wrote, um, which was the game changer for me, uh, the digital economy. Uh, uh, there he was really laying out what, uh, what our future you know, could be expected to be all about as a result of ubiquitous connections. Um, he then examined the sort of the generational dynamics of the connection economy in a book called Growing Up Digital, where he looked at sort of, you know, digital natives, as he's called them, individual, you know, people that uh, were born into um, the reality of, you know, the existence of the connection economy. Um, and uh, there are uh, digital immigrants, I think he calls them. Um, digital immigrants are guys like you and me who, you know, kind of remember what life was like before the internet came along. Um, but uh, some some really interesting insights in the book Growing Up Digital because it allows you to sort of assess the next generation's, um, um, you know, perceptions of what, what the internet's all about and how they use it and what they expect from it. So, I mean, a complete gold mine of, uh, of information and, uh, and ideas and, uh, and, and thinking. Now, now when, you, um, when you take somebody like this who's obviously um, very intellectually forward thinking and you say it's almost philosophical and prescient, how does one apply that to one's life on a day-to-day -day basis if you were like you and me, for example? Uh, well, actually, prob probably not like you in that you've taken all of this and distilled it down to make it workable. But just for the man in the street who has a, um, a blocks and mortar kind of business, how would you apply things from Tapscott to that? Well, I think what you need to do is sort of, you know, um, get into his head and understand what he's thinking and sort of recognize that what he's, what he's really setting out is a, is a scaffold of ideas of, um, you know, very well thought through notions and backed up by research and, um, you know, anecdotal experience, particularly as, you know, new, um, new arrangements are being encountered and experienced as a result of the network economy, the connection economy. Mm. Um, what, I, what I did was I wasn't looking specifically for, uh, you know, uh, pointers or, or guidance or sort of bullet points to say, right, that's how I, um, how I want to uh, sort of adopt what I'm doing around. It was just a case of kind of, you know, um, understanding what what the leading edge sort of intellectual endeavor is in in this space and uh, and coming up with ideas that you can then uh, cross check or uh, assess for yourself as regards you know what you're learning in your own business and mm -hmm. uh, the other thinking the other um you know the other uh, think the thinking of others that have uh, sort of in this space so you know what what Don Tapscott did was as I say specific Specifically for me, gave me the ability to start thinking about the the reality of the disaggregation and the reaggregation of value mm. at its core. 
uh, that's what I what I've taken away from Don Tapscott's work. But you know, as I say, such a prolific thinker and writer, and he's, he's covered every kind of mini um, sort of mini two eye of uh, of intellectual endeavour as regards what's happening as we shift from the industrial to the connection. Uh, and in that regard, as I say, it gives you a scaffold of ideas, and you can um, you know you, you can t you can take his observations. Um, his thoughts and, uh, and sort of you know do with them as you will. Now you mentioned safeguarding privacy. I don't know if you saw um, one of the articles that was posted yesterday on on Facebook about Google, um, and it was one of the American reporters. They actually did a, um, a a little test of taking two phones. They removed the SIM cards from the phone. They uh, put yeah. one of the phones onto. Uh, fly safe mode and then they spent the day yeah. the day driving around the city so bear in mind these phones have got no wi-fi connection no sim card connection they're completely disabled from the internet yeah uh, and one had the yeah. even added layer of the um the flight safe mode then they went and uh, they bought basically a dummy, not a dummy device, but a device between uh, the connection of the telephone to the internet so that it could track everything that was uh, being uploaded from the phone onto the internet. And they discovered that Google is tracking your movements second by second by second, even when your phone is not connected to the internet. Uh, and even when you've got fly safe mode on. So when you're talking about safeguarding your privacy, what's being done to stop this? Well, you can't. At the end of the day, you've got to understand that um, the technology intrinsically engin engenders uh, this capability. Um, so you either have to roll with the punches or you make a strict determination to go off the grid and, uh, and not form part of it. It's churlish in my view. It's churlish in my view to expect to get any kind of privacy these days. Where the where the debate is is to to what extent you know our privacy can be protected, given the reality that you know if uh, if there is a technical mechanism to gather data, uh, these businesses which are all about data are absolutely going to gather it. Okay, but do you think they should make it very clear that you're opting in, and you should be absolutely. able to opt out? I mean, Absolutely. This is the this is this this is the perennial debate, right? Um, mm. But to the extent that uh, you know these technology companies uh, em, uh, engage in the discussion and the dialogue and meet their responsibilities to you know protecting people's privacy, well, you know that's uh, that's a conversation that's uh, going to go on forever and ever and ever, in my view. And I just feel that because of the way that the connection economy works, it's it's about dealing with parties ultimately that you can trust with your data uh, otherwise off the grid you go there's no other way to um, really protect your interests mm. and do you think he was prescient about this or any of the other Who? intellectual heroes uh, top uh, uh, Who, don Ta yeah. Scott. yeah oh yeah 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 absolutely uh, in his book the digital economy he was is very very um, concerned about uh, you know the day the, the future of privacy and uh, you know where that might take us uh, these days he has um, sort of scaled back his concerns somewhat but he's very much you know of the view that it's it's really all about the data collectors needing to be held accountable and the uh, parties that have got the data having the opportunity to opt in or control that data. Mm. You may find, interestingly enough, actually, that, that the privacy concerns might go away in a blockchain-enabled world because um, the uh, common elements that exist to um, drive price data privacy concerns which ultimately go down to the ability to identify who people are a lot of those things technologically will disappear once the once and if the blockchain does become web.50 as i say because it's a without getting into technical aspects of it because i don't know a lot about the technology technological side of it but it's basically a distributed ledger system mm. um, where 
uh, facts and data are that are confirmed as being completely accurate and true and tr therefore trustworthy um, are settled into that uh, blockchain uh, distributed ledger and uh, and only parties that have need to access that information will be able to access that information on a on a fully trusted uh, and uh, engaged basis uh, and you'll find that a lot of the technology companies will no longer be able to engage in sort of drive by data uh, mm. collection and uh, and thereby compromising you know your uh, your concerns as regards privacy so i suspect in real terms uh, a lot of the privacy concerns over time will go away once web.50 is, uh, is 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 upon us mm. um, but for now um, you just have to deal with it the reality that uh, when you deal when you're getting stuff when you're getting stuff for free um, uh, via you know web services uh, it, it always comes at a cost and uh, the likes of Google and Facebook it's all about your data now we've spoken about Facebook uh, on a number of occasions and yesterday I'm sure you'll have seen uh, one of the biggest advertisers in the world said that it needs to tidy its act up otherwise they're going to pull the plug um, Sorry, I didn't say that. You're, you're, you're much smarter than me, so you're reading ahead of the curve. What no, was I just had more about? spare time. Um, yeah, they, they, <laughs> they, um, they have, I think, an advertising budget of 8 or $9 billion a year. Um, of which, which company is it? Uh, Procter & Gamble? No, bigger than that, uh, but similar. Um, Coca-Cola. <laughs> no bigger than that too. Um, no, so what they um, what they said was that they're spending sixty percent of their their advertising budget online, and yeah. if um, a Facebook in particular and other social media platforms, if they don't clear up the fake news, if they don't clear up the way that people are being targeted uh, with information, if they don't remove any of the overly explicit uh, content or anything that they deem to be uh, hate speech, anything like that, they're going to pull their advertising because they feel that their brands are being negatively affected by the content in people's feed, which makes absolute sense. Um, yeah, there's, uh, there's, there's been there's been a lot of there's been a lot of debate about this kind of stuff over the last uh, six to twelve months. You know, um, the overwhelming majority of advertising, online advertising, is 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 auctioned programmatically these days, uh, and there's been a huge um, knockback by advertisers who have felt that they haven't had the correct return on investment for the uh, money that they've been spending, that there have been uh, serious errors in terms of the uh, amount of advertising coverage that they've received. For example, I think Facebook were claiming that uh, an advertisement or a video was watched um, uh, if uh, there were a sort of one or two second engagement on a video. Uh, whereas realistically, the advertisers were expecting there to have been a minimum of six six seconds engagement on a video. Uh, that's just one example, and um, I know that uh, the whole uh, aspect of programmatically buying and selling um, advertising capability more broadly across the web uh, has come under significant fire, and uh, the the major advertisers have been uh, have been scaling back the amount of money they've been spending on so-called digital advertising because there's just so much um, uh, fake stuff going on out there, mm. you know, with uh, with eyeballs that don't exist and bots that are made up of you know um, millions and millions and millions of, um, of of sort of you know terminating ends that that, that that can in a sense click and represent a view. So um, it, it, the other thing about all of that is that because something like 80% of all new advertising spend is going with either Google or Facebook, uh, it's rapidly rapidly becoming a, a situation where the only two internet properties that, that are worth anything these days from an advertising perspective are indeed you know, Google and Facebook. Mm. And, well, uh, it was... a, lot of, a lot of businesses that have got ad-supported ad um, uh, revenue models like you know independent publishers and the like, uh, they're just finding it very, very difficult to keep up because um, uh, they can't command the kind of uh, advertising dollars that you uh, that you could you know otherwise spend with Fe Google and Facebook and get a much better direct return on investment. Well, the the company was Lever Brothers, um, oh, sorry Unilever, and they um, right, yeah. they they spent 9.4 billion US dollars on advertising last year, uh, and more than a third of it is is online, um, and I think the term that they used was they are. Uh, they're not going to uh, work with anybody that's that comes across as toxic. Now you, you're talking yeah. you're talking about determining value. 
I remember in the old days when it was print advertising, and it's still used today, um, they, they check the circulation, and then the circulation determines what the value of advertising is, and your circulation has to be accurate. You can't fudge those figures. I'm sure you can remember in Hong Kong a few years ago, they, they, uh, they gave some, some serious smacks to a couple of publications that were lying about their, their distribution. Yeah, well, you used to have independent agencies like like Nielsen, for example, who are able to uh, properly assess uh, the, the the extent of the reach of mm -hmm. uh, of advertisers via, via, via certain medium, not least television. And then you had all the um, uh, the, the sort of the uh, the organisations that are responsible for confirming circulation of print magazines. Mm -hmm. um, these are all becoming, you know, totally. Dinosauric, if you will, because as the non-online means of uh, communicating to others and advertising um, becomes less and less relevant, then uh, clearly it's what's happening on the web that uh, needs to be assessed for uh, true value delivery purposes if you're advertising on it. And, and in the final analysis, the only parties that can attest to the extent of the reach are, you know, Google and uh, and Facebook. Mm. As, as a consumer, do you respond to advertising on the internet? Uh, I'm curious. I think, you know, something pop passes my way. I, um, I, I, always, I always sort of like to think about, answering, think about answering that question in the following sense. Like, you know, when was the last time that you heard of a completely new brand that was being launched purely on the internet that you immediately responded to and then took on board that brand uh, from scratch as being part and parcel of you know your life going forward. Mm -hmm. um, I can't think of a single internet brand that's, that's emerged from the connection economy. Uh, you've certainly got the industrial economy operators that are, that are you know operating on the internet um, sort of you know industrial economy operators thinking that uh, the connection economy is just the industrial economy with smartphones mm. um, but but no I mean I think I'm probably 90% uh, uh, when I want to buy something 90% driven by uh, going and looking for what I need and then you know past 10% passively um, sort of being sold to and occasionally clicking on a link if it catches my interest but um, mm. I would say once a month I perhaps buy something and usually it's via Facebook because there'll be some video related um, uh, simple quite quite cheap technology that uh, that I think we'll be able to, to use in our practice and uh, I think I bought I think I spent thirty dollars recently on a um, on an ebook manufacturer where you uh, soft piece of software where basically you can take your website you plug in your URLs into your website and then it'll it'll produce a a PDF enabled version of your content that you can then tweak and then turn it into essentially an ebook as well as you know a web page that you can view via the web. Mm. Now, but that's probably about it. Now if I, if I look at setting up the studio um, I, I bought uh, several pieces of equipment which I would have not known about had it not been for the internet. Um, so in, in, in terms of it being a source of a community where I could go and say right what is the best broadcast console to buy? It gave me a range of um, blogs and platforms that I could go to, and then there's usually reviews. So I could distill enough information to make a decision based on a wide variety of viewpoints on one particular console. Um, so in terms of it being connected and a community, I found that very very useful i wouldn't have i wouldn't have seen this particular console in a trade magazine because where i live i wouldn't have found a trade magazine for broadcast equipment so in yeah. that sort of sense it's 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 fantastic but and and now that i'm using this broadcast console i keep getting adverts from them in my facebook page um, that's yeah that's the technology right they, they, they follow you around you can't um you can't avoid it mm. yeah uh, right, uh, coming up for 11.30, I know that you've got a client call now. Uh, what are we going to chat about on Friday? Um, I think we'll talk about uh, Clay Christmas and disruptive innovation, sustaining innovation, efficiency innovations, what the, um, at, 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 at the root 
what's going on as you move from the industrial to the connection, recognizing that you're actually in, engaging in an act of disruption. Uh, and uh, I thought I'd take you through those concepts and um, explain how we've applied those ideas in our own businesses. Fantastic. Great. Thanks very much, Stephen. Have a good week and we'll catch up on Friday.